So if you've been following our 65 Barracuda revival, you remember we came across a situation where the intake manifold, the heat crossover intake manifold was clogged with carbon. Well, that's the old intake manifold that we took off of it. And that gives you an idea of the consistency of the carbon inside the manifold. And that is gonna run all the way through from here, all the way through to here. So if you wanted to clean this out, there's a lot of chipping and a lot of scraping and a lot of, you could get in there with an acetylene torch and blow some of it out. But the idea of saving this intake manifold was ridiculous. So we just swapped on another one. But I want to talk about, see, so we covered how carbon buildup in the intake manifold hurts an engine's efficiency. But that's just scratch on the surface. Because even if the intake manifold, the heat crossover is fine, carbon is still the number one killer of internal combustion engine efficiency, gasoline internal combustion engine efficiency. The two places where carbon really hurts are on the back face of the intake valves and in the ring lamps. So the back face of the intake valves. Now this is a common problem that they have today with uh, direct injection engines. So that's been the trend over the last several years to inject gasoline directly into the combustion chamber, bypassing the intake port and the back face of the intake valve altogether. It, it, the system has its merits, it, it has its issues. But one of the main byproducts, one of the main liabilities of doing it that way is that there's no flow of liquid gasoline over the back face of the intake valve to clean off the carbon residue that builds up. So you see these engines, these direct injection engines, the back face of the intake is just loaded with huge chunks of carbon. Now, those chunks of carbon don't have a very detrimental effect on a direct injection engine. And we could talk about direction, direct injection uh, another time. I'm gonna focus mostly on carbureted, throttle body, and port injected engines, because they all have the same thing in common. So let's, let's, let's put direct injection off the table for the, for the time being. So carbon, where does the carbon come from that you'll find on the back face of an intake valve. So during an engine's cycling, right, with pistons going up and down and the intake valves and the intake and the exhaust valve are opening and closing, when the intake valve opens, there's a bit of what's called reversion. So in other words, the cylinder isn't completely evacuated. I mean, under ideal circumstances on a true high performance engine, yes, there's evacuation at high RPM. But on a typical engine, typical street engine that operates in the two, three, four thousand RPM range, typically, right? Um, when the intake valve opens, there's still a bit of residual pressure from the previous combustion event. That reversion contains partially burned and even fully burned particulates in the form of carbon, and they get blown back against the face of the intake valve. Over time, over many thousands of miles, tens of thousands of miles, hundreds of thousands of miles, it builds up to become a layer, a thick layer. And then you guys who've torn apart older engines know exactly what I'm talking about. It forms a thick layer on the back face and even the front face of the intake valve. So here's where the problem comes. The intake valve serves a very, uh, well, it, it serves two roles. The first is its primary one, which is to let mixture, fresh mixture into the combustion chamber, close and then seal it. That's its primary mission. But its secondary mission is to create vapor. The back face of the intake valve is the first place that the incoming air and fuel charge are exposed to real heat. Now, in order for an internal combustion engine to operate efficiently, gasoline, I'm just stick with this, gasoline, also alcohol, nitromethane to some extent, but specifically gasoline engine that you drive every day. In order for it to operate efficiency, it requires a mix of vapor and atomized fuel. So atomized fuel is just fuel that's broken into tiny, tiny droplets. So you've got the vaporized part of it, and the vaporized part of it is what the spark plug is gonna to try to light. 
It's the part that lights easy. And then once that lights, that's the fuse that lights all of those droplets. The droplets take longer to burn than the vapor does. So the vapor, as soon as the spark plug hits it, it's like the vapor is, bing, it's gone, right? But it's a fuse. So the vapor is used up, the vapor charge is used up the first couple of degrees past top dead center. And then from that point, the fuel droplets are lit and they extend for another 20 or 30 degrees past top dead center, peak pressure. So if you don't have a sufficient amount of vapor entering the combustion chamber for the spark plug to light easily, you get a very, very slow burning or slow start to the process. If you don't have an adequate fuse in the form of vapor for the spark plug to light and to light all of those heavy droplets that are in the atomized form, you get up to a very slow start and so peak efficiency drops. Peak pressure happens a little bit later in the cycle and the later it happens in the cycle, the less power you make unless you've got a huge amount of volume in the chamber, in which case it's okay because that volume will burn for a longer period of time. We're not talking about a typically tuned gasoline internal combustion engine. So what happens is over millions of cycles, a layer of carbon builds over the back half, the back face of the intake valve. And as that happens, its ability to transfer heat to the incoming charge is diminished. The more carbon that's on the back face of the intake valve, the less vaporization you're going to see when the atomized fuel hits it. The less vaporization, the harder it is for the spark plug to create an efficient event, efficient combustion event. Remember, the biggest misconception about what happens inside the chamber of an internal combustion engine is that there's detonation and there's never there should never be detonation you have combustion and the combustion has to be slow and it, relatively slow and has to be controlled when you don't have slow controlled combustion you get pinging you get detonation you get internal engine damage so remember it has to burn slowly and for as long as possible to create the most power as the piston is going down the stroke so back to the pit, back to the uh, the valve so as the carbon builds up, the carbon becomes an insulating layer. So it's, the valve is not able to transfer enough heat for, for uh, adequate vaporization and your efficiency drops off. That right there is the biggest. So if you've got an engine, let's just say you've got a, uh, a motor that's got 100,000 miles on it, right? A regular conventional internal combustion engine with about 100,000 miles on it you'll see that it gets much less fuel mileage and feels less snappy and less responsive as it ages. Now, it's easy to, to say, well, it's because the rings are worn or you know, com compression has fallen off or it's just tired. But what's really happening is that you're not getting adequate vaporization from the back face of the intake valve. And so the engine isn't able to light that atomized mixture as efficiently as possible and then the power falls off and the gas mileage pull, falls off. So you can pull an engine apart that's got 100,000 miles on it or you can do a compression test on an engine that's got 100,000 miles on it and the compression is still way up there. It's still a tight sealing engine but for some reason it just doesn't get the power or the fuel mileage that it used to. That's where the problem is. Now there's one other place and this is this concerns really older engines more than newer engines. Older engines used to use a cast iron ring package and they used a, a fairly thick compression ring and a second ring made out of cast iron. Later engines that have gone to low tension uh, ring packages like stainless rings and whatnot, they don't really suffer from this problem as much as the older cast ring engines do. But one of the things one of the, the design features of a ring package is that when the mixture is lit on the top, top part of the piston, there has to be a sufficient gap around the outside of the piston so that that pressure can reach into the ring land and get behind the ring and push the ring out under pressure. This increases sealing dramatically. So if you ever notice an older engine, a cast ring engine, you'll always see at the very top of the bore is that ridge that forms. That ridge is from 
the normal process of the combustion gases getting behind the ring and pushing them out, expanding the ring out to create a better seal against the cylinder wall. That's where those ridges come from. Later engines with, uh, like, like this piston, this piston is from a, a 2000 Jeep. Um, so this has a thinner, uh, low tension ring package. Doesn't really apply to this, but it does apply to anything that's got a thicker cast type of ring, which is the vast majority of older engines, you know, stuff that classic cars that we deal with. Well, the same carbon that's building up on the back face of the intake valve and hurting its efficiency, well, that carbon will pack up in the ring lens and not allow pressure to get behind the ring to push it out. And like I said, those, the older cast ring engines are designed specifically for that feature, that the pressure gets behind the ring and then pushes out. That's why like the, the big trick back in like the early 70s with like pro stock engines and stuff like that was that they would gas port the pistons. They would drill holes around the perimeter of the piston that would extend down into the ring land to allow pressure to really get behind the ring and create real sealing. Um, that, was, that was common for, for years. I don't think many people do it anymore. But that was the reason that they would gas port the pistons, drill in those holes, get the pressure directly behind the ring and have it push out. So, at any rate, if the carbon is built up behind the ring, or the carbon is built up, let's say, between the ring and the top of the ring land, where that pressure would normally enter, you lose that efficiency. Yeah, your cylinder walls last a lot longer, but you're losing that, that major effect. So, that's a killer. But the real killer of efficiency is, like I said, on the back face of the intake valve as well as other things. You just don't want a lot of carbon in your engine anywhere. It doesn't do any good. What's the fix for this? Well, there are certain high detergent gasolines that are designed to break down the carbon, right? Now, whether or not they actually work is, and, and fuel additives, whether they actually work or not, I'm not even going to debate here because obviously some of them are going to be snake oil and some of them may actually work. I, I, I'm not into the whole mechanic and a can thing. So bypassing that, how do you break the carbon off the back of the intake valve? Not only the back of the intake valve, but the front of the intake valve as well. Because when this face becomes loaded with carbon, it's not able to efficient, efficiently transfer the combustion heat to the back half. So carbon all over this intake valve is a bad thing. They're working out there. So. The typical method we used to use back in the day when this was all very common stuff with carburetors and carbon buildup, when engines weren't quite as efficient as they are today, was that we would decarbon them every time you did a tune up on it. So every like 5,000, you know, 8,000 miles, 10,000 miles. After you did the tune up on it, well, actually, before you did the tune up on it, I still had the old plugs and everything in it. Is you get the engine up to operating temperature. So you get the motor up to whatever it's going to be. Actually, it's best to drive it. It's best to drive it really hard first to make sure that everything inside the engine is at its maximum operating temperature. And then while it's sitting there idling, you trickle water down the intake, whether it's a carburetor or a fuel injector. You trickle water down the intake manifold. And what happens is the water hits the carbon and it breaks the carbon up. It basically steam cleans the engine internally. That's the whole purpose of doing that. You know, I, I did a video on decarboning an engine at some point in the past, but if you're just tuning in now, you take something like a water bottle, okay, you know, just a regular water bottle, and as the engine is idling, right, you trickle some water down, you don't know, you know, just pour it, but you trickle the water down the intake, right, the carburetor or the injector, you trickle the water down while you wing the throttle, right? Because you don't want to let the water just pile up in a cylinder or an area. You want to keep it, you want to keep everything moving rapidly. So as you're trickling the water, you rev in the engine. And like I said, that will break up the carbon. The carbon comes off in big chunks and efficiency is restored. It also helps decarbon the combustion chambers 
Carbon in a combustion chamber is more of a problem because it'll create hot spots. So some of that carbon, if the carbon is very thick, built up very thick on the inside of the chamber or on the top of the piston, uh, that carbon can start to glow, right? And it becomes its own source of ignition. So you end up with knocking and, you know, pre-ignition, you end up with knocking and, and stuff like that, pinging for no other reason that the carbon inside the combustion chamber is now a glow plug. <laughs> so carbon inside the motor is always bad, right? And those are the two main areas where it's gonna hurt the efficiency of really any internal combustion engine, but really specifically the older ones that rely on a cast ring and that cylinder pressure getting behind the ring to push it out. Ultimate solution is to never let that carbon build up to any great extent. Uh, running the engine on the lean side or at least making sure that it's not running fat. Now, if you can walk around the back of the car and you can smell the exhaust, you can guarantee it's laying carbon. It's laying layers of carbon over all of those internal engine parts. Making sure that the engine is tuned properly uh, and occasionally blowing out the carbon. That was a big thing back in the old days, right? You'd hear, you'd hear somebody say, I'm going to take it out and blow out the carbon. And it was a common thing where you take your car and you take it out on the highway, the interstate, whatever, and you'll let her fly for a mile or two. And that extreme use will break up any of the loose flakes of carbon and send them out the exhaust. So, you know, best done in Mexico, right? All right. So that's pretty much it. That's all you think I wanted to say about carbon and engine efficiency. Keep it clean and clean it out every once in a while and blow the carbon out. And it's really cool to blow the carbon out when you've got a car next to you also blowing the carbon out. It's a great excuse for the cops, right? Hey, man, we're just taking care of our engines. I'll see you tomorrow.